freedom. What an incredible concept that is. Now, you know, most people in most places over most of the time in the history of mankind have not had freedom. Quite the opposite. Most people in human history have lived under bondage. They've lived under tyranny. They've lived under either an oppressive government or an oppressive individual. What we have in the United States of America has been an incredible experiment in freedom, in democracy. Never has a nation had the freedoms that we have now. That's why people come here. That's why people seeing all the craziness that people are trying to get into this country because there's opportunities here. There's opportunities to live differently. There's opportunities to choose how you might want to live. But freedom, liberty, is not man's idea. Freedom is God's idea. That's where the concept comes from. Think back to the book of Exodus. God looked down and he saw the children of Israel were in bondage. They were in slavery. And so God raises up Moses to liberate them. And he tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh what? Let my people go. Then we see the ministry of Jesus Christ. He begins his public ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue. He opens the scroll up. The scroll is open to Isaiah 61, again, Old Testament. And Luke 4, 17 says, And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. Jesus' whole ministry was setting people free. A freedom from sin that no one could do but Jesus. And everywhere Jesus went, as we know, just read the Gospels, people couldn't get enough of him. Because everywhere he went, he cast out demons. He healed sickness. He raised the dead. But the true freedom that Jesus came to give was an inner freedom. Now, this morning, I want to talk about freedom. I want to say three things about freedom. The first one is this. Freedom from government tyranny. Freedom from the curse of the law. And freedom from selfish living. Let's begin with freedom from government tyranny. Now, we all know the Apostle Paul wrote Romans. And in Romans 13... Paul says, all government that's been established has been established by God, and we are to obey that. That's good. That's true. Unless the government tells us to do something that God specifically says not to, or unless the government tells us not to do something that God says specifically to do. But I don't think that gives the full story. Because the apostle Paul had a dual citizenship, and he was very aware of it, just like We do. If you know Christ as your Savior, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You've been born again. You have a new place, a new king. You live in the kingdom of God. (coughs) Excuse me. But we also have a citizenship, and my guess is most of us are American citizens, maybe not all of us. And the apostle Paul knew that about himself. He was a kingdom citizen. He was called (coughs) to preach the kingdom, to spread the kingdom. But he also knew that he was a Roman citizen. And he repeatedly displayed a strong insistence that the legal rights that he had as a citizen be recognized and not be trampled upon. He flexed his political muscle, his Roman citizenship when he had to. Now, when I read about being a Roman citizen, maybe tops might have been 20% of the Roman Empire. 
But other statistics say, no, it's probably only 5 to 6%. Either way, 5 to 20, very few people were Roman citizens in the Roman Empire. Now, among the rights of a Roman citizen was that they were free from being beat without a trial. They had the right to be tried before the emperor instead of a, a local court, and they had the right not to be executed by crucifixion. Now, in Paul's second missionary journey, he comes to a place called Philippi, and there he casts a demon out of a slave girl. And the slave girl's masters were very upset because apparently this slave girl was making a lot of money for her masters. And so they got the magistrates to take Paul and Silas and put them in jail. And not only did they put them in jail, they beat them illegally. And then later on, after Paul is released from jail in Rome, excuse me, Acts 16, verse 37, Paul said to them, to the Roman magistrates, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. Paul says, wait a minute. This wasn't about personal vengeance, revenge. This was about personal protection under the law that the apostle Paul had because he was a Roman citizen and was being treated illegally. And so he exercised his rights. Some years later, after Paul was almost killed by a violent mob, a misinformed mob in Jerusalem, a Roman commander ordered him to be scourged to try to find out why this was, ta why this was taking place. And in Acts 22, 25, it says, But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? The man was mortified by this. He says, you're a Roman citizen, Paul? Paul says, that's absolutely right. I was born a Roman citizen, which was very unusual. We don't know how he achieved that, but he did. And then the Roman commander says, you were born. I had to buy my citizenship. In other words, I can't do this to you because you're a Roman citizen. You have certain rights before the law. And so he doesn't have Paul scourge. Meantime, Paul gets sent to Caesarea, where he's going to go on trial for this supposedly breaking of, of the Jewish law in the temple. And so Paul, as he's before the Roman governor, Festus says this in Acts 25, 11. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar, which was the ultimate right of a Roman citizenship. Bring me to Rome. That's where I'm going to have my case tried, not by these local yokels here who are going to ramrod it through and are going to extract vengeance upon me. Paul exercised his legal rights under the Roman law. Now, we know eventually Paul is arrested again. He's sent to Rome. And tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded in Rome, not crucified, because they couldn't do that to a Roman citizen. Now, why am I saying all this to you? Because as citizens of the United States, we have certain unalienable rights which have been endowed by our creator to quote the Declaration of Independence. Rights given by God. And these rights are specified in the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Let me read you the first amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In other words, Congress cannot have a state religion. That's what that's saying or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or prohibiting whatever religion you have that you could carry that out, or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of people peacefully, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, it was not wrong for Paul to insist on his rights as a Roman 
citizen. Even though he was a citizen of the kingdom of God, it didn't mean he was no longer a citizen of Rome. He still was. And we as an Americans, citizens of the kingdom of God, still have constitutional rights to be respected and recognized. When governors and mayors last year demanded the closing of churches, but they allowed retail stores, liquor stores, abortion clinics to continue to be open, but not churches, or they imposed certain mandates on churches when they gathered together, but those mandates were not binding to mobs that were running in the street. I think that was a blatant violation of our rights as American citizens. See, I believe the United States of America is a gift of God, a gift of self-determination, self-government, and freedom. Now, I don't believe this country is taking the place of Israel. God is still going to deal with Israel. That was the nation God called. He's put them on hold right now as he deals with the church. He's going to come back to them. So we haven't taken that place. But there's no doubts that God has blessed this country greater than any country ever. And like I say all the time in here, for us as a church, and I say us as a nation, we have been blessed to be a blessing. The United States of America has been, is now, the number one sending mission nation that's ever been. Now, why is that? Because we've been prosperous. We have freedom. And because of our freedoms, we've been able to, to prosper. And our country, and in particular, North Shore Bible Church, we've always been committed to mission since the beginning. We are right now, as you know. That's part of the fabric of our church because we've been blessed with the good news of Christ. We want the gospel to go throughout the world so that other people, no matter what country they live in, no matter what restrictions, can hear the good news, can hear about Jesus Christ, can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and know true freedom. But these freedoms that we have come from God. So we've been blessed here. And I just want to say that we have freedom from govern, government tyranny. Now, I want to pivot here. So as great as that freedom is as being a United States citizen, there's even a greater freedom that God provides internal freedom no matter what government you live in. The second part of the sermon is going to be, a, I could preach this to any audience, anywhere, any place on the face of the earth. And here's the second freedom. The second freedom is that we've been given freedom from sin. We've been given freedom from the curse of the law. Jesus says in John 8, 36, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And we're going to look at the book of Galatians. Galatians, Paul wrote to, to, to the Galatia area, and some people call it the Declaration of Independence of Christian Liberty. Because there were these teachers coming there, Judaizers they were called, and they were telling the, 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 the followers of Christ, listen, Jesus, you need more than Jesus. You need to follow the law. You need to have certain restrictions. You need to get back under the dietary restrictions, moral code. And Paul says, uh-uh. Don't put yourself back under bondage because Jesus has set you free. And in the book of Galatians, this letter to Galatians, he demonstrates the superiority of the justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. You've been justified. You've been declared right before God, not anything that you've done, but solely because of what Jesus Christ has done. So Christ has freed the believer from bondage of the law and has placed them into a place of liberty due to the gospel. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, the gospel I preach, and the gospel is the good news that Christ died for sins, was buried and rose from the dead, and anyone who puts their trust in him can know forgiveness of sins and have eternal life. If anyone comes to you with another gospel, he says two times, let them be accursed. Let them be cursed of God if they add anything, if they change my gospel. 
So Paul says about the freedom from the curse of the law. And I believe the key verse is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul says this, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Paul, three times here, says that following the law, that is, following what God has said, rules, rituals, regulations, no one will be declared right before God. Three times he says that, and then three times he says, there's only one way. There's only one way, by trust in Christ, faith in Christ. So the law can't justify anybody, never could. Only Christ can. So then he writes a little later on in Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase, says this. Plant your feet firmly, therefore, within the freedom that Christ has won for us, and do not let yourself be caught again in the shackles of slavery. Now, notice the declaration, the declaration of Christian independence. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Who set you free? Jesus Christ did. You couldn't do it to yourself. Jesus is the great liberator. He's the one who sets people free. Freedom is a gift from God, given to us and received by faith. Freedom is a gift given for people who strive, who've tried to please God, who've done all that they can, who go to church, who give money, who try to do good works, and they still can't quite feel that they're good enough. They've tried their best. Listen, tyranny by government is a terrible thing. But tyranny to sin is even worse. Tyranny to sin is not only inwardly shackling someone, but if you're left in that state of tyranny to sin, it leads to Eternal condemnation. The freedom that God gives one when they trust Christ as their Savior is this. Freedom from sin's power and guilt. Freedom from the curse of the law. Freedom from eternal punishment. Freedom from God's wrath. Freedom from satanic authority. Freedom from the fear of death. Furthermore, freedom... God gives you is freedom from the shame and tyranny that others will put on you. Their opinions, their expectations. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. Not that we don't want people's advice, but people trying to tell you everything you need to do for your soul and may not know exactly what your soul needs that only God does. See, freedom is the ability now to obey Christ from the heart through the eternal leading of the Holy Spirit. Christ died to set us free, not to make us slaves. So then he gives this declaration, then he gives a command. Therefore, keep standing firm. Persevere with your freedom. Persist in your freedom. It takes effort to stay in the place of freedom and not to go back to slavery again. See, someone who's legally made free in Christ, can still live in bondage by placing themselves back under the slavery of legalism. Now, what is legalism? Legalism is an attitude or a mentality based on pride. It's expecting other people to live up to your standard or your expectation of righteousness. It's rules that you use to determine if that person is spiritual enough or not. Not necessarily what God has said, you understand, but maybe passed down through tradition, maybe given through certain religion, not spelled out in Scripture. Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians 2, Paul confronts the apostle Peter because Peter, who God had used to preached the gospel to the Gentiles, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and God had made it clear in Acts 15, the, the, the um, council at Jerusalem, that 
the, the Jewish, the, excuse me, Gentile believers coming to Christ no longer were subject to the law, the moral and the ceremonial aspects of the law. Now, Peter kind of forgotten that. Peter is now shunning Gentiles from having lunch with them because they're eating unclean food. Paul gets wind of this. And what does Paul do? He confronts Peter face to face and says, what are you doing, Peter? God set us free, free through Christ so we no longer have to do this. I'm so glad that that's in the Bible right there. Because that still exists today. Now, legalism today, I'll give you an example of it. Some of you might have grown up in this tradition, know about it. We've all probably grew up in some legalistic tradition. But some churches say, especially women, you know, if you're really spiritual, you'll have real long hair, and you'll always wear long dresses. That determines your spirituality. Are you kidding me? Some external thing now. Now, God does say you should dress modestly, okay? But that doesn't determine if, what's going on in your heart. I mean, it may. There might be some indication. But that doesn't determine that. So Paul says keep standing firm because freedom is worth fighting for. People will try to put their expectations on you and make you follow what they think is best for you. Now he gives a negative. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. A yoke, you know, a, a yoke was a, a device for, for, for putting domesticated animals together. You know, it's usually like a wood thing, you know, two oxen, one ox will have one, the other, and they'll pull like a, a plow behind them. Okay? So Paul says, don't go back to the yoke of slavery. And this is no yoke. No joke. <laughs> They're trying to bring him back into Bob. I'm glad Claudia you're here. I was laughing at my jokes. Um, teachers, the Jewish teachers counted that there were probably 613 laws in the Old Testament, do and don'ts, that you had to follow. 613. Can you imagine that? I mean, you couldn't go throughout the day. You couldn't even count the 613. Because that was God's standard. Now, why was the law given? The law was given to show if man on his own, if he tried to please God, this is what he had to do. He had to follow all these do's and don'ts because all these do's and don'ts reflected God's holy, righteous character. So for us to achieve that righteous character on our own, we have to follow all these things. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just in action, but thought, word, and deed. Now, why did God give us that? Well, Paul said earlier in chapter, well, not my God, God gave it to us to show us moral character, but Paul says in Galatians 3.10, he says, for as many as are, as many as, as are the works of the law under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. If you didn't carry out every single law, you'd be cursed. James says in an epistle, if you break the law in one place, one time, one sin, you've broken the whole law. Well, what are we going to do? We've got a problem. That's why Jesus came. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He bought us back from the slavery, the bondage of the law. How? <laughs> Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus, because he lived a perfect, sinless life. When he died on the cross, the law's demands were perfectly satisfied by holy God. Now, now... Ever since, anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, the law's demands are met for you because Christ died in your place and fulfilled the law for you. See, the law was demanding. It was a harsh taskmaster. There was no grace there. It just said, you do this, don't do that. Well, you say, well, man, the law was terrible. No, it wasn't. 
the law was good. Because, number one, as I said earlier, the law reflected God's holy, righteous character. But second, the law, as Paul says in Galatians 3.24, the law becomes a tutor. It becomes a guide so that we come to a point, we say, man, I, I can't do this anymore. I've tried my best. All my religious works, and I still don't feel like I'm pleasing God. So the law drives us to Christ, and we see who Christ is. We see that he's come to save us from our sins. We see that he's come to set us free, and Jesus tells us that. In Rome, I'm excuse me, Matthew 11, verse 28. Listen to these incredible words of Jesus. Come to me, he says, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, these three verses, look at all these personal pronouns. Come to me, learn from me, I will do this for you. Now, what's he saying? Come to what? Certain church? particular denomination, certain teacher, list of rules, do's, don'ts. No. He says, come to who? Me. It's personal. We come to Jesus. You know, we talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I love that because that's exactly what it is. Jesus says, look, I came for you. I came for your sins. Now, you come to me. And those who are weary and heavy laden, that is, those who've walked around feeling the yoke of religious rituals, that things are hard, they're demanding, I can't live up to what the church tells me and all the expectations. I can't live up to what, you know, my, my, my friend who tells me what I should do and don't. Shouldn't do. I can't live up to that. I'm weary of this. I'm burdened from this. And it says Jesus is the one that gives you rest. He's the one who refreshes your soul. He's the one who, who gives you peace and joy. And who qualifies for this rest again? Anybody who's heavy, laden, and weary, and tired. And no, they can't do it themselves. That's who qualifies. And Jesus goes on in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ's yoke is easy. It's manageable. He's pleasant to walk side by side with each and every day of your life. He's pleasant that whatever you're going through, no matter how burdensome it is, that he's walking right there with you. Every step you take, he steps right beside you. He's pleasant as you learn from him, as you follow him as being one of his disciples because he's gentle and humble. He's not going to demand things from you. He's not going to yell at you when you fall short. Jesus was the most approachable person in the history of the world. That's why wherever he went, people clamored to be with him. They couldn't get enough of him. Because he says, I'm going to walk with you. He doesn't say, you're never going to have a burden. That's part of life. But he does say that I will be with you and help you carry every burden and make it light for you. So now that Jesus has come into your life, and you've been awakened to his grace, you've been set free. He, Jesus, has provided freedom from slavery to sin. And, and now that same Jesus who saved you now lives within you. That's what happened. Paul writes in uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives with me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself 
himself up for me. And now what happens is this. Because Christ lives within you. He totally loves you. He's totally pleased with you. He's never disappointed with you. That's hard to believe. But he's never disappointed. Well, what about when I sin? He's got to be disappointed then? No, he's grieved because he knows when we sin, we hurt ourselves, but he's never disappointed. For him to be disappointed with you, he'd have to be disappointed with Jesus. And for him to be disappointed with Jesus means Jesus would have to come back, come back out of the tomb, come back out of dying on the cross and not be the sin, sinless Savior. It can't happen. It's impossible. So he's always pleased with you because the believer is now in Christ. That's your new identity. That's now your new position. And so that's what Paul says in Romans 8.1. There's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus and never will be again. Now, not only is there freedom spiritually, but what God begins to do in our hearts and our lives, he begins to transform us. He begins to change us from the inside out. And he begins to break us from those shackles sometimes from the demands of others, right? You should do that. You shouldn't do that. You could have done that. I wish you wouldn't have done that. We all have those regrets. But Jesus says, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't let those things drive your life. Define your life. Because now I am defining your life. I've freed you from sin. I will never bring them up again. And yes, there'll be times when you fall short. But even in those times, I will never quit loving you. Revel in the freedom that God has given you because your salvation did not, does not now depend on your efforts, but it did and now depends on what Christ has done for you. A great Puritan, John Flavel, said this, We are justified and saved by the very righteousness of Christ and no other. He wrought it, produced it, and we wear it. So they've been set free. Now the question is, how will these Galatians now use this new freedom? The question is for us the same. If you know Christ, how do you use your freedom? Well, Paul's going to tell us, Galatians 5, verse 13 through 15, and he's going to talk about freedom from selfish living. Verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now, our flesh, even though we've been born again, we've got the spirit, we have new life, we still have our humanity. We still have this part of our unredeemed humanity called the flesh. We still struggle. We will struggle till the day we die. And then when we're with Jesus, there'll be no longer any presence of sin. And part of the flesh is we have this tendency to go to one of two extremes. One extreme is the legalist, as we saw. Now, the legalist satisfies himself by thinking God is satisfied also by the strict code of do's and don'ts, which the person imagines demonstrates his righteousness before heaven, and God's pleased with that. The legalist is bound up. The legalist is restrained. Now we come to another person, the other extreme. This is the libertine. The libertine satisfies himself by rejecting all codes and living completely according to his personal lusts and desires. The libertine says, hey, I've been saved by grace. I could do what I want. God saved me. No, if you have that idea, then you don't understand grace. Grace is, cannot be earned. It's unmerited. But grace is free, but it's costly. It costs Jesus his life. So those who say, I could send up a storm. I'll just confess that I'm okay then you need to understand grace better. Because grace doesn't give us freedom to sin. Grace puts in our heart a desire to please God and sin less. So for the libertine, he's unrestrained. The legalist is bound up. Now, we are called to walk between the two of these and live in freedom by guarding our own freedom jealously, but at the same time exercising our freedom lovingly. And it says you are called to this. That word called, the verb, it, 
It's a fact. It's a past tense, but it's past if it was done to you. When were you called to this? You were called when Jesus called you to himself and caused you to be born again. That's when this freedom began. Now, my flesh expects others to conform to me, to do what I say, when I say it, where I say it, how I say it, with who I say it. It's all about me and my interests. That's what the flesh is. And the flesh is always involved with using and manipulating others. That's the exact opposite of what Paul did in his ministry. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Here's what he tells them. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. Paul says, I didn't come here trying to manipulate you or puff myself up. Now, if anybody could have done it, it was Paul. He was an apostle. But he says, I, I never took advantage of anybody. Not only that, but he goes on and says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 17, Certainly, I've not taken advantage of you through any of those whom I've sent to you, have I? In other words, not only did I not take advantage, but even the, the men I sent to you. I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Titus did not take any advantage of you, did he? Did we not conduct ourselves in the same spirit and walk in the same steps? Paul says, I never use my platform for selfish gain. See, Christian freedom treats people as persons to be served and loved, not as things to be used and abused. And Paul goes on and says, but through love, serve one another. We love each other not from pressure from without. I'm not sitting up here and saying, hey, you better go out and love each other right now. I can't do that. But the reason we love each other is because of the great principle from within. Because Christ now lives within us. And that's exactly the, the pattern Jesus set, right? Jesus was the freest person who ever walked the face of the earth. He had more freedom than anyone. But what did Jesus do? Did he come and demand people serve him? No. He came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So the Christian is free before God so that we might use our freedom among men to be involved with helping them also be set free. And that's what the gospel does. It liberates people. So we become like Jesus who came to set free those who are oppressed. So living under grace is not a life of license, but it's a life of love and service. And then he closes, he says, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, as you yield to Christ more and more to his love, then more and more you love others. This solves every problem in human relation. Because if you love people because you love Christ, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie about to them. You're not going to gossip about them. You're not going to envy them. You're not going to try in any way to hurt them. You want the best for them. And then he finishes up this section in verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Apparently, there were some Galatian believers who were going at each other. They were bickering and fighting and who, who knows what else. But Paul says, listen, you're destroying each other. Stop it right now, because that's not what God has called us to. Let me close with this. Let me say it again to you. Freedom is not man's idea. Freedom is God's idea. And as an American, living in a nation that has been blessed from God, we're free from government tyranny. As a follower of Christ, we are free from the curse of the law and we are free from selfish living. These freedoms are not automatic. 
we must work to protect our freedoms because it's easy just to not be vigilant, just to fall back and to allow other people, other voices to manipulate you and guide you. March 23rd, 1775, this was before the Declaration of Independence. This was before the Battle of Concord and Lexington, which kicked off the American Revolution. An attorney named Patrick Henry addressed the Virginia colony. We were still colonists then under England. And he, he addressed the Virginia colony convention, and he said this. If we wish to be free, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left in us. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. The gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? If life is so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery, for, forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We thank you that we have just worshipped you without fear of being put in jail because that is one of our rights as an American citizen that we can gather together to worship you. We're not commanded to worship one religion, but we have the freedom, as many other churches are meeting right now, to worship you as we see fit. So we thank you for that freedom, Lord Jesus. But we also thank you for even a greater freedom, the freedom that you've set us free from the curse of sin. You've set us free from just living selfish lives, that you've set us free to love each other, that you've set us free to take this great message, the gospel, and love others and tell them the good news that Jesus has come to set the captives free. So as we leave here today, I pray that we might take our liberty seriously and that we might live as free people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.